Johnson from Florence Baptist Church, my daughter Chastity, my grandson Justin, and my grandson John, their wives uh, Anna and Grace, and I've got eight great-grandchildren uh, with, with them today, uh, or, or I think they're all, I, I've only had Jace jumping on me, so I, I don't know, but uh, I want you to welcome my family. Would you do that? Praise God. I wish there was some way that I could capture all of them and, and transport them down here. Uh, they, probably, they probably would not like that, but Mom and I would love it. We would love it. We would love it a great deal. Let me also uh, say, you know, please excuse the, the mess out here. <clears throat> We've had a, a bad leak I've heard today. It's probably been leaking underground for about a year. And, uh, and it finally bubbled up to the surface and was creating really a mess out here. They had to come out, didn't know where it was, had to dig and 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 dig to find the, to just trace the line from the well to the building to find out where in the world is this at. It ended up, <laughs> had to completely take out the ramp, and um, which by the way is a, really a blessing in disguise, even though it's it's more of an expense, and I understand all that. But you know, the landing, the landing on that on that porch out there is too narrow. Uh, the ramp is too narrow, and uh, and so what's going to happen is, as soon as that line is now through and under the 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 breezeway, uh, and and in the place where it needs to be for the new building that's going to be going in, um, that that. You know, this whole setup out here, this whole porch and ramp setup, it's going to be completely demoed out, and we'll put in a whole new landing, a whole new ramp system in there, and uh, rails and all of that uh, will go back in. So be patient. It's coming along. It's, uh, I want to say thank you to Pastor Chris. I'm telling you what, he's, he's had his hands full these last several weeks, and, um, and he was down here kind of kind of keeping an eyeball on things down here while the workers were working. So thank you, Pastor Chris. I really appreciate that very much. That's <coughs> you know, Thanksgiving, this time of the year is always a time for thanks, but I wonder how many times we miss it. And I've often thought about that even myself. You know, Pastor Randall, how many times, I mean, you're always seeking God for something. You're always asking God to provide. You're always asking God to do this, asking God to do that. And we should. John R. Rice said years ago and wrote a book about it, Prayer is Asking and Receiving. And that's true, and that's what it's all about. But we ought to have a time for thanks, amen? There ought to be a time, and, and of course, you know, Thanksgiving originated way back in 1621, there were three days of fasting and prayer followed by feasting. <laughs> That's the best way to end a fast is with a feast, amen? And, uh, and all these Plymouth uh, colonialists that, that were there, and, and you know, don't, don't let the history revisionists destroy your idea about America. Um, you know, the, the, <laughs> I don't know if the schools could ever be fixed. I honestly don't. But... You know, America had a great founding. The first national Thanksgiving Day was proclaimed by President George Washington, our very first president. It was celebrated November 26, 1789. That was the very first Thanksgiving. And then in 1863, right in the middle of the Civil War, and you would think, wow, why would we have Thanksgiving in the middle of the Civil War? But... President Abraham Lincoln made Thanksgiving an annual holiday for us to commemorate. It's been, been this way ever since 1863 on the last Thursday of November. This Thursday we'll have Thanksgiving. And in, 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 unless we lose America to the communists, we're going to have Thanksgiving next year until the Lord takes us home. <laughs> There's going to be Thanksgiving after Thanksgiving after Thanksgiving. At least I'm praying and hoping that that's the case. But Thanksgiving can have a, a great origin. It can even have a great legacy. 
But I think, I think sometimes Thanksgiving has lost a lot of its original impact. I think as time gone on, I think, and I'm speaking to God's people, I, th- I think that it's easy for us to let things slip. And all of a sudden, we're not spending some time just thanking God. I, I, I'm not saying it has to be all of the time, but boy, it sure de- needs to be some of the time. Amen? In First Chronicles 16, if you're there, I'm going to begin reading in verse 8. And it says, Give thanks unto the Lord, call upon His name, make known His deeds among the people. That's testimonies tonight. I thank God for, and then you share what you're thanking God for. And we'll keep it brief so that everybody can enjoy a, a, a testimony. Sing unto Him, sing psalms unto Him, Talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord with his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his marvelous works which he hath done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. That's how... I think that we celebrate a time of thanks. And so we set aside our evening service, 5 p.m. this evening, to have a time to remember the Lord and to thank Him. You know, I, I, I just think it's so, so important for us to do this. I think, sadly, Christian, listen to me and and. and don't be upset when I say this, but I think oftentimes we have suffered from selective memory disease. I, I think that if you're thinking about things that I've been thinking about recently, I think that you're going to stop and say, boy, first of all, I, I, I'm just so thankful, thankful to God for this and this and this and this and this. I'm thankful. My, I've got family sitting. I'm so thankful that they came down. Now, I, I wish the occasion of their trip and their being here was different. But, but God was in control of all that. I'm just thankful that I have some family. I'm, I'm, I'm truly thankful about that. Psalm 50 and verse 14 The Word of God says, Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High. Psalm 95, 2. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto Him with psalms. And then Ephesians 5, 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, but how are we to express this thanks? Well, it's simple. It's two words. Just give thanks. Just number one, just give thanks. In in 1 Chronicles 16, 18, that's how it starts. Or 16, 8, I'm sorry. Give thanks unto the Lord. Give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon His name. Make known. That's a testimony, isn't it? Uh, You know, when you speak... For the Lord, when you speak a testimony for the Lord in thanks, what are you doing? You're you're making known His deeds among the people. I thank God because God has done this. God has, you know, whatever. Whatever your testimony might be. What a blessing. And the God of heaven is blessed by us doing that. You know, don't you feel a little bit down when you maybe have done something for somebody and didn't even get thanked? And hasn't that probably happened to every single person in this room? And even though you didn't do it so that somebody could just lavish praise all over the top of you, thank you is not bad words. And when they don't happen, eh, it's not like we're going to totally lose it. 
but you walk away and you go, wow. Because nobody appreciates ungratefulness. It's okay to say thank you. One of the reasons why I like Chick-fil-A, for instance. I mean, <clears throat> they got good food. I'm not, I'm not knocking that. They got good food. But a lot of places have good food. Okay? A lot of places have good food. I was asking, uh, I was asking Sierra just a minute ago, uh, how's Pinocchio's? Because she chefs over there at Pinocchio's. Pino I like Pinocchio's. I do. Um, I don't care what's on, uh, well, I, I'm not going to say anything, but I, I, you know, I hear people complain, I like Pinocchio's, you know. Uh, it's a nice place. It's not as polite as, as Chick-fil-A. I like ordering food and having someone say, how may I help you? And you know, well, I'd like to have this. Well, of course, we will provide that for you. And uh, make my order. And uh, uh, would you like anything else? And I, uh, no, that's, you know, that about covers it. Well, thank you. I, you know, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. I like that. If they had lousy food, I would go buy lousy food just to be treated decently. Giving thanks. We call upon His name. It implies going into the presence of the Lord. We'll do that tonight. We need to set aside a time to give thanks. You know, I, I, I'm not so sure that just doing this annually is what we should do. Maybe we ought to do it quarterly. Maybe that's, maybe that's what we ought to do. And, uh, and, but there has to be a time set aside for proclaiming thanks. And first, you know, first we ought to, when we're giving thanks, we, we first ought to give thanks for what? Our salvation. Are you saved this morning? Well, you know something, beloved? None of us deserve to be saved. Every living last soul in this place deserves to go to hell. And you go, wow, I, I, I didn't think I was that bad. We're not talking about bad, we're talking about lost. You know, listen, we were born lost. We were not born in tune with God. We weren't. The whole human race was plunged into sin when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. The whole, they were... I mean, the paternal and maternal head of the entire human race of the world. And sin is a blood disease. It's passed in the blood. That's why uh, it is the blood of Christ that cleanses. It's a blood disease. It's passed through the blood. We inherited a sin nature. You don't have to... I mean, I love my great-grandkids, but... They're too much like their grandpa was when they were, you know, when he uh, he was their age, you know. I mean, uh, I love I love it though. I do, you know. The it's a wonderful thing to be a grandfather. It is. It's an absolute wonderful thing. Anybody want to say amen to that? Yeah, there's a few of you. And uh, and you know, but you don't. You find out real quick being a parent and a grandparent. You don't have to teach these kids to do bad. You don't have to teach them to do bad. They woke up doing bad. <laughs> they dreamt about doing bad the whole night. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm having fun here. But we, we're born with this sin nature. We don't, we don't deserve salvation. So why don't we just thank God for it? Thank God for it. Thank God that the only place that you will ever find total 100% complete forgiveness is with our Heavenly Father when you come to Him and ask Him to save you. Boom! Your sins are gone. Past, now get your mind wrapped around this, past, present, and future. Why? Because he already knows everything about our life. He knows the, what the end of our life looks like. He knows everything about us. And when Jesus died, he died for the whole complete package of sin. 
Now, does that give us license? Oh, well, if it's already paid for, I might as well go out and do it. No. Paul said, God forbid. God forbid that just because grace exists that we should go out and sin. No. I mean, is that how we show thanks to the Lord? Those sins are what nailed our Savior to the, to the cross. Oh, no, we don't want to do that. We want to thank God for, for our salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Boy, it is, isn't it? And isn't it wonderful that it's a gift? Hey, what if you could only be saved if you were seven foot four? What if you could only be saved if you gave four million dollars to worthy causes? What if you could only be saved if you were handsome like the pastor of Elmwood Baptist Church? <laughs> You'd be in trouble. You'd be in trouble. If you've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior, if you've never been born again, as Jesus said in John 3 to Nicodemus, if you've never been saved, you ought to call on the Lord to save you today. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's that simple. Religion has goofed it all up. I, I, I'm telling you, religion is the worst thing that ever happened to mankind. Salvation is simple. And if it was any more complicated than what I just said and what the Bible has stated, well, then none of us would have gotten saved. And so, secondly, we ought to give thanks for our family. We ought to give thanks for our family. So while we're giving thanks, let's give thanks for salvation. Let's give thanks for our family. I wonder how often we pause to thank the Lord for our families. Betty and I have routinely prayed by name through our entire family, and and many, many others, of course. And we pray specifically about things. We pray specifically about their well-being. We pray specifically about their spiritual growth. We pray specifically for Elmwood, for Florence Baptist Church and, and, and for the growth of the church and for uh, our, our son-in-law and daughter. And we pray specifically for every single great-grandchild by name. And we pray for friends and we pray for other pastors and other churches and missionaries and various different ones. And we pray, of course, for Elmwood. And we pray for all of the things that we see listed on our, our prayer sheet that we get, each one of us get a prayer bulletin. And we pray for Fairview. And we pray, you know, I mean, listen, there, there, all, of, all of us ought to, be, ought to be given to prayer, but it ought to start with, thank you, God, for my salvation, and thank you, God, for my family. I kind of jumped ahead a little bit, but thank you, God, for my family. In Psalm 127.3, it says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. What a blessing. What a blessing it is to have family. And you know, if, you don't, if, you're, if you're here today and you say, well, you know, God, God didn't bless us with any children, then adopt a few. There's a whole mess of them running around here. Uh, you know, ha- hang around a little bit. You'll find them crawling underneath the seats. You'll find them, you know, I mean, you'll find them all over the place. Hey, adopt a few. You know, we've been called grandma and grandpa by more kids, more than our actual grandkids. That's okay. That's okay. We like that. We have a nice church family. Thirdly, we ought to thank God for a good local church, and that's our theme this morning. That's our, that's our theme for this Sunday. We thank you, God, for our church. There are places in the world, there are believers that have been reached uh, by by various different means that don't have a church. And even in America, even in America, there are places where there are believers that there are no really good gospel-preaching churches. Now, America is up to here in religion. 
And we have no shortages in religious institutions from sea to shining sea. Now, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, is there, are there places all over, dotted all over America, where we could, where we could honestly, honestly say, there's a good gospel preaching church there, and there's a good gospel preaching church there, and a good gospel pre, where someone, where a preacher who's not ashamed will open up the word of God and preach, thus saith the Lord. Too many entertainment ministries out there. Johnny Spandex and the rubber bands for 45 minutes, and then some CEO comes out and speaks for 25 minutes on some kind of motivational thing. I'm sorry. That's not going to get the job done. And when you're at the deathbed of somebody, what Johnny Spandex played the Sunday before is not a great comfort. And I used to be Johnny Spandex, in case you're wondering. Except I never wore spandex. That's just a... <laughs> in fact, I'm, I'm sorry I said that because now you've got that image in your mind and you're... <laughs> but we ought to thank God for a good church. And, and here's what the Lord says in Ephesians 5.25. He says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. There's a sacrificial component to that, isn't there? He, he, he loved the church, and so, boy, we husbands are kind of on the line here. Just as Christ has loved his church, by the way, this building is a building, and this church is a church. He loved the church. He died for the church. And so... Uh, there was a sacrificial element to this, and husbands were to love our wives in a sacrificial way. That's a challenge. It is. If, if, you're, a, if you're an honest husband, you're going to say, like I've said many times, you know, I've failed at that a hundred times, but keep striving, keep striving, keep trying, keep, keep, keep doing it. But that's how much the church is important to the Lord. That's, that's how important the church is. And, and the church has fallen on hard times. We're in 2021, and, and I don't think there's ever been a time where there has been less church attendance than there is now. COVID wiped out a whole mess of churches. And a lot of people, even several families of Elmwood Baptist Church have never made it back. And, and fear has prevailed all over our country. And it has had a, a, a detrimental effect on the church. And then they say, well, the millennial generation is not interested in church. Well, we got millennial age. We, our church family, more than a church, we're a family. Our church family covers the entire spectrum. From newborns to, to uh, senior citizens. And we're happy about that. And that's the way it ought to be kept. And that's the way it ought to be maintained. And that's the way it ought to be prayed for. That's the kind of church that I'm talking about today. I, I'm, I'm, I'm standing up here, and I know it sounds a little self-serving to say, well, Elmwood's a great church, but I think it is. Because it's, it's filled with great people. And I, I, think that we ought to, I think that we ought to praise God and thank God uh, for the church. It's where we can come and we can learn the Word of God and we can take the things that we learn and we can inculcate those into our lives. And, and it can have an effect on our raising of our children. You know, you, I, I, over the years, not that I've, not that I've nef necessarily taken notes and, and kept statistics on this, but I will tell you that in many, many uh, times, in many situations, that I have been aware of, I've seen where there's been parents that have kind of been lackadaisical when it came to the church. Well, you know, if it's convenient, I'll be there. If it's not, you know, it's, you know. And the church was not something that was, that was paramount in the family. And what I've, what I've come to see over the years is that those children grew up without any kind of real interest in God, the things of God. Oh, they might go to church on, 
Mother's Day to make Mama happy or go to church on Father's Day to make Daddy happy. And, uh, and most of the time that won't happen. Or maybe they'll come to church on Easter because after all, that's the biggest, you know, Easter and Christmas are the big events of the year. But you know something, beloved, many times, many times what happens is the fulfillment of what we see in Galatians where God says, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. You know, we, we minimize the importance of church. Um, we're, we're, we're there if it's convenient for us to be there many times, let's face it. I've told people... Um, uh, often that that they're they're moving. I say, have you found a good church? Uh, they have a job. I said, have you found a good church? Are you sure you want to take that job? Have you found a good church in that location? And I tell them, I said, because here's the truth. You'll drive for a paycheck. You'll drive through a blowing snowstorm to get a paycheck because you know that if you don't, you won't get paid. But if there's two and a half inches of snow on the ground, you're going to say, well, Mabel, I don't think we're going to church today. And that's sad, isn't it? That's sad. Is church all about convenience or is it about commitment? Uh, What if the Lord was as faithful to us as we are to him? That'd be a pretty sad thing, wouldn't it? A church is a wonderful thing, man. Get yourself into it. Join it. You know, membership is mighty important. And the Bible, by the way, talks about membership. And, and, and maybe that's a message for another time. But, but it, get in. Immerse yourself in. Say, you know what, we're going to... When we were, I, I got to say this because I'm sitting here looking at two ladies that had an, a, pro, a profound effect on two young Christians that, that many years ago, we won't say how many years ago, but we, many years ago, that we didn't know up from down, front to back on the Bible. I mean, none of it. But you know something? We, uh, <laughs> Cheryl's husband, Pastor Mark, he was on me. I've told this story, I know. Please, please bear with me. I love to hear it. <laughs> I mean, he was on me. I mean, every week he was at the Randall house. I mean, there was a couple times, and you know, he's smaller than me. And, and I remember one particular time, I, I went and I pulled the curtain back, and, and, and Mark was standing on, oh, I can't do this. I can't do this today. Uh, you know, something lousy was going on in my life or something, you know. And I remember hiding behind the curtain. <laughs> I'm, I'm supposed to have this reputation as this, you know, you know guy that we won't go there. But, but here I am. And, and he's knocking on the door, and I'm hiding behind the curtain. I, you know, the video of that has got to be totally hilarious, okay? But he never gave up. And I asked him at one time, I said, why, why didn't you just quit coming? He said, because you never shut the door. Well, that particular time, I never opened the door. But, but I'm so thankful for that. And And... And because we were important to them and we were important to the, our home church. And we got in. And I remember, well, we finally came. And Sunday morning, wow, okay, that's good. We'll come back. And then Pastor Mark said, yeah, you know, you really ought to come and check out Sunday evening service. And, and back then, Sunday evening service was... I, bl- I believe it was 7 o'clock. It was either 7 o'clock or 7.30. I can't remember. And, uh, and so, okay, well, we went and checked it out. Hey, this ain't bad either. We went a couple times, and, 
Next thing you know, that brick got mortared into the wall. Well, now the Randalls are Sunday morning, Sunday night. We liked it. And then all of a sudden it was, it was well, why don't you come Wednesday night? Man, we have a Bible study. We, you know, we pray for folks. And, and I was a little nervous about this prayer thing. You know, anybody know what I'm talking about? Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. And uh, I remember the devil put in my mind. He did. The devil puts things in your mind, too. Shut him out. But I remember the devil got me all fearful about that and said, you know, if you go there, Pastor Dion's going to ask you to pray. And oh, man. So I, we didn't go for a little bit, but then finally, you know, Pastor Mark kept inviting, inviting, and we came. And, and I got to tell you, man, I came, I came, and as Pastor did it then, the, the men, you know, the men went in his uh, study and, and prayed together, and the ladies with Mrs. Dion, they were all praying together about various different things and various different whatever personal needs. And uh, I got into Pastor's study bunch of men in there and uh i'm looking for a place where i can sit the only place there was to sit and and i later figured this out that the the men the other men didn't sit there because they didn't want to lead in prayer that was the lead in prayer chair <laughs> i didn't know that so i went and, like a dummy i went and sat down in that chair pastor dion said well gentlemen We've taken some prayer requests, so let's go ahead and go to prayer. Uh, Gary, why don't you go ahead and start us in prayer? I thought I was going to die. <laughs> I thought, but later someone said, you know, it is so sweet to hear a new Christian pray. And that kind of helped me. That kind of helped me. But I got to tell you, man, I love my church family. I loved my church family then. I loved my, I've been in a few churches and serving the Lord. I've loved my church family there. I love this church family immensely. I thank God for this church. I thank God for it. But you know, we give thanks, and there's something else we ought to do. Number two, we ought to sing. There ought to be some singing. We're going to have some singing tonight. We'll sing some songs tonight. First Chronicles 16.9 says, Sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, talk ye of all his wonderful works. So we'll have some testimonies and we'll have some singing. And we'll do it. And that's an expression of joy. Singing praises God. Music is vitally important to the worship of any church. It is. And why do we sing in church? Because uh, there's just nothing else to do? No. We sing because, the, the, and this is where, you know, I, uh, for those of you that are fairly new, uh, when I was lost, I was a, I was a professional rock musician. I, I played the, the, an, another brand of music, okay, that, that didn't mean anything. And I've, I've even got the lyrics of, of songs that we played many, many years ago. I've kept a file. The songs we sing now and the songs that gripped me when I was a baby Christian were songs that the, that the lyrics made sense. And you could hear them. And they, 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 they all spoke of God. They were all about God. They weren't about man. They weren't, they weren't flesh-centered. They were God-centered. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. Those are doctrinal songs. Those, those are songs we sing them and they teach us. So we need to sing. Psalm 107 verse 8, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. What's God done for you? You know, I hope you don't stay home this evening. I, ho I hope that you think about what I'm preaching and you say, wow, I want to thank God. I hope you come because you want to thank God. And number three, we ought to seek Him. 
That's what verse 11 of 1 Chronicles 16 says. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face continually. Continually seeking him. Continually thinking about him. You know, one of these days, our life is going to be over, and then it's going to be in heaven, and it's not going to be about this life. My pastor, and I see that Jeff and Catherine and, and, and uh, Josiah, it's good to have you here today. God bless you. Can we welcome them as well to Elmwood Baptist? <laughs> Praise the Lord. But you know, I was told, I was told by one of the daughters, Pastor Dion was, was, um, was, going into really very massive heart surgery. The doctor said his blockages were so bad, he was, he was on the verge of the atomic bomb heart attack. In fact, he said, I don't know how you are even alive. And that was before his surgery on Tuesday. On, on Sunday, he preached Sunday morning, Sunday night at Valley Baptist Church in Oswego, Illinois. How he did it? Only the strength of God. But he made this comment to one of the girls, and she shared it with me, and it was the only thing that bothered him about the fact of going into to surgery that quite possibly he might never come out of, and he didn't. He said, I haven't been the witness and soul winner that I should have been. Listen, my friend, that ended up being a deathbed. And God blessed Pastor Dion for even acknowledging that, and before he went into surgery, he led one of the nurses to Christ right at his, right at his bed prayed with her. And I'm, I, I tell you, I was so proud to hear that. But he made that comment, and he was being genuine. And I wonder how many Christians can identify with that statement. Because here's a man who's looking at his own mortality, and it wasn't about 46 years in my, in my church, and it wasn't about how many cars did I drive, and what kind of house did I live in, and how much money did I make. All of a sudden, when you're facing your own mortality, it is about, I am going to stand before the Lord. And so when I'm talking about, let's give thanks, I'm also talking about, let's be faithful. Uh, let's, let's put our own selfish desires to the side. Let's put our own fleshly whims to the side and Let's decide to be faithful. You know, if your car only started one out of every four times, would you call it faithful? If you owned a business and, and, and some of your employees only showed up uh, three days a week instead of five days a week, would you call them good employees? Hmm? Hey, if, if, if you skipped a couple mortgage payments on your house, would the banker say, well, you know, 10 out of 12, that's okay. In your marriage, you want 100% faithfulness. 99% is not going to do the job. Well, why should it be any different when it comes to us worshiping God and being faithful to His church and and, and seeking Him, and lastly, and remembering Him. First Chronicles 16, 12, Remember His marvelous works that He hath done, His wonders and the judgments of His mouth. The wonders of God, the judgments, the miracles. We've had, oh, we've had a lot of miracles. How are you going to express your thanks to God this evening? How, how are you doing it even now? Are you thankful for salvation? Are, are you thankful for your family? Do you pray for them by name, individually, and all through the whole group? 
said, well, I got a big family. So do I. And it's important. And are you thankful for your church? And, and, and are, you, are you willing to commit yourself to the Lord's church that he loved and gave himself for? Do you praise him and do you seek him and do you remember him? Or do we get so busy in life that the Lord is just simply an afterthought? Oh yeah, the Lord. Oh yeah, oh yeah Thanksgiving. Oh, oh yeah, I'll be there. I'm stepping on my toes. I'm stepping on your toes. Or maybe I'll say it differently. The Holy Spirit of God's got this thing. It's important for us, amen? If God's word says so, then honestly, oh, we ought to line up with God, amen? The Lord said in Luke 6, 46, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Good question. We want our children to obey, but do we obey our Father? Good question. Maybe this morning you're a Christian and you say, you know what, my thanks to the Lord has not been what it should be. Maybe if you're physically able, you can find your way to an old-fashioned altar and you can say, God, here I am. And, and there's got to be a place where I, where I do some business and I say, Lord, you know, I've, I've been a miserable failure when it's come to this stuff. And I've let, I've let my mind be occupied with a billion other things. And sadly, sadly, you're rarely ever one of them. But Lord, that's going to change. That's going to change. Because I can still do my, I can still be involved in life and I can still have God be first. I can do that. Possibly you're here this morning and you're not saved. I'm not saying you're not a nice person. I'm not saying that you're not a, a decent human being, really. I'm sure you are. The question is, are you saved? Hell is not for bad people and heaven for good people. Hell is for lost people. Heaven is for saved people. We're not good enough to be saved. But he saved us by his grace. If you're not saved, why don't you ask the Lord to save you today? Why don't in this Thanksgiving season, why don't you settle that issue? Because eternity is coming for every single one of us. And are you ready? Are you ready? Let's bow our heads together quietly. Father, as we close this service, I'm asking and praying for anyone who might be here today who is not saved, that they would hear, that they would hear the Holy Spirit of God right now. And that still small voice is saying, you know, you need this. You need this. You've been battling with doubt and fear. And you need to settle this. And with our heads bowed and our eyes closed,